I'm excited to preach this morning. I feel like, you know, God has been uh, clearly doing something in our church, and it's really cool. Um, the other morning, I was at my son's basketball game. Thank you, brother. And uh, I was walking through just the basketball courts on the way to their practice, and you know, sometimes I forget that I'm a pastor. <laughs> and um, no, I'm kidding. I was I was taking my boys, and I got stopped like four different times, just like within like a hundred yards to get to my son's basketball practice, and and every single person was like, "Hey, I, I don't go to your church, but I watch it online," or you know, I do go to your church, or I I came, or whatever it was. But it was just all these connections to God's house, and to hey, I know this person that goes to your church, and I just want to like thank you. And it was just really, really cool to see that we're not just making an impact here in these four walls, but uh, man, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is going out around our desert. And it's not just about you know this house or this church or these four walls or what we're doing, but it's really about giving all glory and honor to the name that we just sung about. Come on, the name that's above every other name. And I always just immediately point people back and say, man, God is good. God is working in us and through us. And um, man, we just give him all the honor because it is truly, truly his. Because if he really knew me, if he really knew me, then you'd be like, I don't know about this guy, you know? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but today we're starting a brand new series titled More Like David. And uh, I'm very, very excited about this series because, you know, sometimes you preach on certain subjects and you're like, man, we needed that. That was good. But I love preaching about um, like David. I love preaching about like hero stories and underdog stories because, you know, we're going to talk about like David and Goliath and we're going to talk about his life and we're going to talk about all the ups and downs uh, of David's life. And so I'm really, really excited about this. I know that God is going to speak something to us that I believe will change our lives forever. Amen. I hope and pray that you didn't just come in here to church this morning just to hear from me, but you actually showed up and said, man, I want to uh, take something from the word of God and apply it to my life. That way I can leave better, right? Isn't that kind of like the goal that we can leave feeling equipped to take on uh, the purpose and the plan that God has for us? Uh, we're not just trying to be uh, church Christians. You know those people? Like they're just, they're only Christians at church, you know, and then uh, it, throughout the week, they're a whole nother animal. They're a whole nother beast. Uh, we're trying to live our lives. We're trying to be submitted. We're trying to honor God, uh, not just with our Sunday mornings, but with our Monday mornings, right? With our Tuesday afternoons and when our, with our Wednesday nights and with our Saturday nights. Come on, somebody. We're, we're trying to honor God with our whole entire life, not just with our words, but with our deeds. Amen. And so we're going to look at the life of David. And um, the Bible has a lot to say about David. David's actually the most talked about character in all of the Bible, aside from Jesus. There's 66 chapters in the book, uh, in the Bible, all about David. David is an Old Testament character. Many of you know his story, and, and a lot of us should, or at least have heard of David, but um, a lot of his stories come from the Old Testament, but he's actually mentioned in the New Testament 59 different times. And so I think God wants us to learn about this man named David in the heart and the prayer of this whole series is that we would leave and we would go, man, I want to be more like David because David was described as a man after God's own heart. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a man that's after God's own heart. I want you to be a woman that's after God's own heart. See, David had a lot going on in his life. David had a lot of high moments and David had a lot of low seasons. David had a lot of mountaintops and a lot of valley lows. David had a lot of really, really, really good things that happened in his life. But David, also had some things in his life that he probably wishes he can have back. Like David had a lot going on in his life, but through it all, whether David was a shepherd boy out in the field or whether David was standing as the king of Israel, one thing remained true about David, and that was David loved God, and David served God, and David tried to honor God all the days of his life. And really, David's whole life was just a foreshadowing of the king of every king, of Jesus, who now sits on the throne. And if that's your car going off right back here, <laughs> just feel free to get up at any moment and just turn off your alarm. <laughs> we just call it how it is here in God's house. Amen. Amen. And so there's really two sides to David, right? And sometimes there's, if we're being honest, there's two sides to us as well. So on one hand, you have David who's, who's courageous, you have David who's brave, David who is, who is bold, right? David, he's kind, he's a leader. But on the other hand, David is kind of childish at times. David 
can be vindictive at times. David can be shrewd at times. David, uh, you know, could do things that hurt some innocent people at times. See, the best qualities of David's life, or we can say his biggest strengths, really preview for us the, the life of Jesus. But David's lowest moments, David's, David's biggest weaknesses, really prove the necessity of Jesus' death for us. See, the best of who David is really serves as an appetizer of the life of Jesus. And the worst of who David is really serves as a reminder to us of our dependence on God. And so where does the story of David begin? That's what I want to talk about today. And we're going to take some truths from the word of God so we can be more like David. Amen. So let's pray this morning. Lord, thank you. Uh, Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. God, we come here to be equipped to go out and do the work of the ministry, God, to go out and and reach the lost, go out and heal the sick, God, and go out and proclaim the good news. Go out and proclaim freedom to the captives, God. We thank you for what you're doing in this house. And God, we open up your word today and we pray that the Holy Spirit would be here and would be active in this house that he would speak to us and customize the word like only he can. And God, I pray for every single person that's sitting, sitting under the sound of my voice that they wouldn't just hear me, but God, they would hear from you. And so have your way in this house. We submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen. 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 See, David was an underdog. And who doesn't love a good underdog story, right? Like everyone roots for the underdog. Would you agree? And if you don't, well, we'll pray for you because something is clearly... <laughs> clearly wrong with you. Like if you sit in a movie and you're not going for the underdog, then there's some heart issues that you have going on. But I was trying to think, I was talking to the guys in the back, like what are some of the greatest underdog stories that we can think of? Feel free to shout them out. Like what are some of the greatest underdog movies? Some of, some of the guys were saying, Rudy, Rudy is a, an amazing underdog story. Or uh, for me, I was thinking of cool runnings. Come on, who knew black people could bobsled? I was like, that's a good underdog story right there. For sure, no one thought they were going to win, right? Or uh, maybe, uh, what was it? Uh, maybe I was Spanish. I was say, Jesus, you were saying something? Um, I don't know what you were saying. Um, but everyone loves a good underdog story. I was thinking about dodgeball. Remember dodgeball? The average Joes, I was going for them. But uh, man, David... David started out really as an underdog. David was someone who was overlooked. David was someone who was put out to tend the sheep that no one wanted to tend to. He was, he was looked at as someone that didn't really have any value or didn't really have any potential. Maybe the question for you this morning is, have you ever felt overlooked? Have you ever felt undervalued? Have you ever felt like maybe people didn't see your worth? Have you ever thought about yourself as being an underdog? Have you ever felt like maybe life was just working against you? No matter what was going on in your life, it was almost like you were going through a season of suffering. You ever been there before? Like you don't know how to get out? Romans 8.18 says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. See, I just want to tell you this morning, I feel like God is about to pull the curtain back on all the underdogs, that God is about to reveal the gifts, the talents, the hidden treasures that have been on the inside of you your whole entire life, that God has been establishing you. God has been building you up through a process of pain, through a process of tears, through a process of, of prayer. But this is the moment that the underdog is about to break through. Come on, is there any underdogs in God's house this morning that for so long you feel like you've been hidden out in the field, you, you feel like you've been overlooked, you feel like you've been undervalued, but see, God was just building your character because he needed to make sure that your character matched your calling when you got revealed to the world. See, the story of David is someone who seemingly just comes out of nowhere. And what David does is he turns the whole world upside down. He was hidden out in the field. David was just tending to his father's sheep. Picture David out in the field just bah all day long, just out there tending to the sheep that no one else wanted to tend to. But it was in those moments, it was in those long days, it was in those early mornings and those late nights that David learned how to trust God. It was in those moments where David learned how to have courage 
It was in those moments where David learned humility. It was in those moments where David learned how to fight a bear and tame a lion. It was in those moments where no one was looking at David that his character was being revealed, that his character was being built up, that his character was being established. So one day when the, when the prophet came knocking, he was ready to step into his calling. See, your days out in the field are not wasted. Who am I preaching to this morning? Your days out in the field are not wasted. God's just been preparing you for what he has for you. The trauma that maybe you've walked through wasn't your final days. The trauma was just the training for what God had in store for you. God has just been preparing you for your destination. See, 1 Samuel 16 is where the story of David starts. This is 1 Samuel 16. We'll read verse 11 through 13 this morning. And it says this. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending to the sheep, Samuel said. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. In other words, the the prophet was saying, nothing is going to move in this house until the one that God has chosen arrives. See, some of you don't even know it yet, but there are things that are stagnant right here on this earth that are not moving until you arrive. There are businesses, there are movements that are not moving yet because you haven't arrived. There are ideas, there are opportunities, there are positions that cannot be filled right now because they're waiting for your arrival. Verse 12, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Come on, this is the one right there. This is the one. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I'm going to preach today from this title, if you're taking notes, overlooked, undervalued, and still anointed. (laughs) Come on, tell your neighbor, say, I might be overlooked. I might be undervalued, but child, I'm still anointed. (laughs) See, David was a shepherd boy. David lived at his father's house in the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that's interesting. Bethlehem, that's, that's familiar. Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Who else was a shepherd that came from Bethlehem? I don't know. Maybe we'll put that together a little bit later. But Bethlehem, it sounds really familiar. See, Samuel was a prophet of God. And Samuel was sent to uh, Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel. The current king, his name was Saul. And um, without getting into too much detail, Saul was a mess. Saul had been the king for several years. See, the, the nation of Israel, they didn't have a king. They were led by God. Come on, God was their king. And God used judges and God used prophets and God used Moses and God used Joshua to lead them. They didn't have a king. God was their king. And God freed them from the Egyptians and God brought them into the promised land and God was their leader. But see, what happened over time is the nation of Israel, they want it to be like everyone else. They want it to be led by a man. They want it to be led by a king. So they started complaining and they started asking the prophet Samuel, we want a king like all the other nations. And God tells Samuel, he says, tell the nation of Israel, they don't want a king. They don't want to be led by a man because what's going to happen is that king will take them into war and that king will start start to tax them and that king will, you know, take their women and that king will make their men soldiers tell them they don't want a king. But how many of you know that when God speaks, oftentimes, many times we don't listen and we're like, I want it my way. And so God's like, fine, if you want it your way, I'll give you your Burger King, right? And so he gives them their king and their king's name was Saul. And Saul, he looked like a king. Saul had the stature of a king. Saul was strong. Saul was tall. Saul had all the makings of a king. In man's eyes, he was everything that the nation of Israel was looking for. He was wealthy. He knew how to take charge. But over time, something happened to Saul. His heart began to to shift. Saul became paranoid. Saul became insecure. Saul began to care too much what people thought. Saul began to take matters into his own hands. Does it sound familiar like any of us? Saul began to not trust God so much, but he began to trust himself. And so one day the the prophet gets a word from God. 
And so Samuel goes and he speaks to Saul and he tells him, listen, Saul, I know you're the king. I know you were chosen by God, but I need to let you in on what God is saying. He said, listen, you've disobeyed God and God has rejected you to be the king of Israel. And Saul's like, wait, what are you talking about? He's rejected me. I've done all these things for God. I just won this battle for God and Look what I did. I I took the cattle and I took the sheep of this town that we took over and I I offered them to God as sacrifices. Look what I'm doing for God. And 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel replies to to Saul and he says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. In other words, he's saying God is not looking for empty religious rituals and offerings. God is looking for a life that is fully devoted to him. To obey is better than sacrifice. And so Samuel tells Saul, the king of Israel, that God has chosen a new king. Now, they didn't know at the time, but the new king that God had chosen was just a shepherd boy out in the field of Bethlehem. Theologians say David was anywhere between 10 to 15 years old at the time that he was anointed to be king. And so picture the moment, right? The prophet Samuel gets a word from God. I've chosen a man after my own heart to be the next king of Israel. And so Samuel goes to Jesse's house. Jesse was the father of David. So picture the moment David is at home. He's out in the field and Jesse's inside with all of his other sons and the man of God comes to the house. The prophet of God shows up, knocks on Jesse's door, and he says, hey, Jesse, I need to let you know something, that one of your sons is about to be the next king. I mean, how would you feel as a father? Hey, we made it, we made it, we made it, right? One of y'all about to be the king, hey. Like, you would be, I know how I would feel. Like, boys, we made it, we're going to the palace. I'll get me a back room, it's all good. One of my boys is about to be the king. This is good news. And see, what's funny was when Samuel showed up, like Samuel was a real prophet. Samuel wasn't like one of those TV prophets that you see, you know, like nowadays. Like just buy this water right now. It comes right from Jerusalem. It will heal your knee. Like he wasn't one of those like weird TV prophets. Like Samuel was a real prophet. The Bible says that every word that he spoke, none of his words fell to the ground. And so when Samuel showed up, it was a really big deal. And so when Samuel tells Jesse, one of your sons is about to be the king, you could just picture the excitement on Jesse's face. And so what does Jesse do? Jesse grabs his sons and he grabs the the firstborn, right? Eliab. He's like, "This, this is my firstborn. This is the alpha. This is the big dog. And you could just picture, right? Let me, I didn't plan, this, this is not planned, but come on, Alu, come here. You kind of look like Eliab. <laughs> like if I had a son, come up here. If I had a son, I would be like, I need you to see my boy. This is the big boy, Eliab. He's tall, he's strong, right? The alpha, he's got everything that God's looking for in a king. He's smart, he's wise, he's built like a king. Look at him, prophet. And the Bible says that Samuel, in that moment, looks at Eliab, and in his mind, he thinks like, yeah, yeah, that that one's got to be the king. Look at him. He's tall. He's strong. He's got to be the king. But God, in that moment, checks him in his spirit. (laughs) And he's like, let me teach you something, man of God. (laughs) You don't always get it right, man of God. Let me show you what I look at, man of God. See, God says, I don't look at the outward appearance. I, I don't look like, I don't look at the stature I don't look at the size. I don't look at how they're built. I look at the inside. I look at, at the heart. First Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. He's like, ew, not today. You can sit down. Thank you, brother. God's like, no, uh-uh. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. See, that's why many of you, 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 you've been overlooked because you don't have all the degrees necessary. You don't come from the right family with all the, with all the money. And so people think they know you based on how you look. 
(laughs) People have been judging you your whole life based on your outward appearance, but they don't know. They don't know the dreams that God's put down on the inside of you. They don't know that you've been staying up late and waking up early, preparing yourself for God's purpose and plan for your life. They don't know that you've been out in the field just faithfully serving. They don't know that you've been spending time with God just getting get better at your craft. They don't know that you've been out there just fighting lions and bears. They don't know. And so they've been overlooking you your whole life because they only see what's on the outside. But God sees what's on the inside. And so Samuel was fooled into thinking that Eliab was the one based on how he looked. See, let me encourage you this morning. Don't get upset when people overlook you. Don't get upset when people don't pick you because God just may have you hidden out in the field for a reason. That's the first point I want you to write down this morning. See, David, David was faithful in the field. And God may just be keeping you hidden right now because he wants to make sure that you don't need validation from outside sources. He wants to make sure that you don't need validation from other people. He needs you to be secure in who he made you to be. (laughs) If they never promote you, if they never pick you, if they never choose you, you're like, I'm good. I know who I am. I know who God's called me to be. And so God rejects Eliab. But Jesse's like, that's cool. It's all good. I got my, I got my other son, Abinadab. Come on, where's, come here, Abinadab. Yeah, come here, Abinadab. Yeah, you, you look like a, you look like a king. This, none of this was planned. Because if you were Jesse and you had seven of them, right? You're like, it's all good. You don't want Eliab? I got Abinadab. Look at my boy right here. Strong. He's tall. Good looking. Looks like a king, right? Kingly. And God's like, ew, no, (laughs) not today. And he rejects the second son. And so Jesse's like, all good. I got another one, Shema. Come on, where's Shema? Come here, Shema. Come here, Shema. Come here, Shema. Come here, Shema. Come on, Shema. See, they're getting a little smaller, but that's all good, right? And so God, so Jesse's like, I got Shema. He may not be as tall or as dark, but he's still strong. He still looks like a king, acts like a king. He has all the qualities. Look at him and God's like, ew, no, I don't want that one either. I'm not taking him. And so one, I can keep going all day. Like I could just call the big dudes, right? But son after son, four more times, God rejects all of them. God's like, I'm not looking at what you're looking at. So verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. Samuel is now probably confused in this moment. Like, Lord, I know you sent me to Jesse's house. I know you you sent me to Bethlehem to, to choose the next king of Israel, to anoint the next king of Israel, to put your blessing on the next king of Israel. And Jesse has presented me with all of his sons, and you're telling me you're rejecting all of them? So verse 11, where we started today. So we asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? Jesse is probably thinking in that moment, yeah, all the the sons that I would choose to be the next king. (laughs) All the sons that I'm proud of, I've presented to you. (laughs) See, some of you have been overlooked even by your own father, overlooked by your own family, made to feel like you didn't fit in, made to feel like you were the black sheep of the family, made to feel like you were the different one, made to feel like you were the one that was just the outcast. But let me just say this, You are on this earth for a purpose. (laughs) You might have been uh, born into this world by mistake, but let me just tell you, friends, you are not a mistake. (laughs) Like your parents may not have planned you, but God planned you. Who am I preaching to this morning? Like you were the accident child, but let me tell you, there is no accidents in the kingdom of God. Like God has chosen you. God wants you here. And so Jesse presented Samuel, this prophet of God, with seven of his sons. Seven is the number of completion. When God created the world, he did it in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. It was complete. When Jesus was hung on the cross to die for our sins, he uttered seven statements. The rainbow is made of seven colors. When Joshua marched the army around Jericho, they marched around seven times. In the book of Revelation, there is seven churches. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do we need to forgive someone? He said, seven times, 77 Peter, uh, seven is the number of completion. And so Jesse presented 
seven of his sons to the prophet Samuel, and God said, it's a complete no. <laughs> it's no. So Samuel looks back at Jesse, and he says, is this all the sons that you have? Well, he says, they're still the youngest. Jesse answered, he's, he's tending to the sheep, Samuel said. Send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. See, David was out in the field just doing his job. Out there just singing, writing songs, fighting lions, fighting bears, just out there serving. David was the run of the family. David wasn't liked by his older brothers. David had a, had a different mom. The Bible says that David was born in iniquity. He wrote that in Psalms. He was conceived in sin. And so Jesse, he calls David. David! Come inside. There's someone here that wants to see you. But I'm sure that when he sees you, he's going to realize that you're not the one. See, David was son number eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. See, David was faithful when he was forgotten. That's the second point this morning. David was faithful when he was forgotten. David was so overlooked by his own father that his Father didn't even invite him in to be a part of the opportunity to be the next king. But what was hidden from men is always revealed by God. And maybe you find yourself in a season of life right now where you feel hidden. Don't worry. God's about to reveal you to the world. Maybe your life right now, there aren't a lot of people watching your progress. They aren't, there aren't a lot of people paying attention to what you're doing. Don't worry. Come on, you're about to be revealed to the world. Just stay right there in that field. Just stay faithful when you feel forgotten. Serve the season of life that you're in right now. And one day you might just get a knock on your door and someone says, I'm here to anoint the next king. You've been out in the field just, just worshiping. Come on, you ever feel like that? I've just been out in the field just faithfully doing my job, just faithfully serving, just faithfully raising these kids, just faithfully opening up my Bible, just faithfully spending time with God. Nothing's really happening right now. Nothing's really moving right now, but I'm just faithful because I know this is the season that God's called me to be, and I'm just faithfully doing my job with integrity. I'm just faithfully out, just tending to my father's sheep. Come on, has, have you ever been there before? Like you're just faithfully doing something for a long time and nothing seems to be moving, but all of a sudden one day you might just get a, a knock on your door. I'm here to anoint the next king. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because man doesn't, God, God, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God's going, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for, for a woman that's, that's not seeking position. That's not seeking validation. That's not seeking platform. That's not seeking a microphone. I'm, I'm not looking for that. I'm just looking for someone that's just faithfully. Hey, good morning. How you doing? So happy to be here. How can I serve? How can I give back? How can I bless? I'm just faithfully looking. God is looking to the Davids who's just out in his field, overlooked by his father. Stay faithful when you're hidden. Stay faithful when you're covered up. Stay faithful when you feel undervalued. Stay faithful when you feel underappreciated because God is about to reveal you to the world. The things that God is about to do, I believe, are so big in this church, are so big in your life that we're going to go from, I never heard of you to, I've been expecting you. Like I'm trying to have the faith of David and the heart of David. That's just like, man, we're just serving. We're just blessing. And all of a sudden I'm here to anoint the next King. I'm here to elevate you. I'm here to reveal you. I'm here to bring you from the pasture to the palace. Come on. I'm here to raise you up. That's what God is looking for. So I just want to encourage someone today that maybe you feel like you're in a season of life where, man, this is just a wasted season. It's not wasted. God's about to take what felt like a wasted season and turn it into a wonderful season. Come on. He's about to take your broken seasons and turn them into a blessed season. He's going to take the dream that you thought was dead and he's going to 
bring it to new life. And so Samuel said, send for him, for we will not sit down until he arrives. See, when you're in the presence of authority, what do you do? You rise. And so David begins walking towards the house. And I'll have the the worship team come join me. David begins walking towards the house and picture the scene for a moment after taking care of the sheep all day. That didn't even belong to him. They belonged to his father. David, who's full of dust. David, who is sweaty. David, who smells like sheep. David walks into the house and he sees his jealous brothers, all seven of them standing there, probably judging them, judging him. David sees his dad, Jesse, standing there, probably with the look of disappointment on his face. David then looks at the man of God, Samuel, standing there with a a horn of oil ready to anoint the next king. And God speaks to Samuel in that moment as David walks through the door of his father's house and David still has the dirt on his face and David still smells and (laughs) the prophet in that moment gets a word from God and God says, anoint him. That's the one. You could picture what was probably happening in the mind of his brothers and in the heart of his dad. Wait, 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 wait. Are you sure? David, the smelly one, David, the the little one, David, the runt, David, the, the little shepherd boy. Shouldn't David get cleaned up first? Shouldn't David take a shower first? Come on, you're about to anoint him with oil, which represents the Holy Spirit, which represents the presence of God on his life. Shouldn't David at least clean up prophet of God before you bless him? You missed it. See, you think you got to clean up your life before God will anoint you. You think you got to clean up all the mess going on before God will ever use you. See, that's why, and that's where the church is missing it. Because for so long, the church has presented itself like this perfect spotless lamb. When we're not, only Jesus is. And so we've presented ourselves as better than. That's why your friends don't want to come to church, because they think Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites who act one way but project another that you got to get all cleaned up before you come in, that you got to fix all the mess before God will use you. See, this is exactly what the brothers were thinking. Doesn't David need to clean up? He's just the runt. Come on, God doesn't want to use him. He's the little one. He's dirty. He's smelly. He spends all this time with the sheep. And God's like, that's the one. Anoint him right there. And so in that moment, Samuel, the prophet of God, anoints David to be the next king of Israel. And so now David's walking around with the dust of the field and the oil of the Holy Ghost all over him. (laughs) Isn't that who we're called to be? Isn't that what our life should look like? Oh, we walk around with the dust and the dirt of our past. Oh, but friends, we still got the oil of the Holy Ghost all over us. That's why people are attracted to you. That's why people can relate to you. That's why people are so attracted to this church, because we don't act like we only got the oil of the Holy Ghost on us. We're aware that we still got some dust of the field on our life and we're going through a process of sanctification. We're going through a process of cleansing. And so we don't act better than anyone else. We just say, God, I got some dirt on me, but God, I got a surrendered heart to you. And so God, anoint me right now in this moment because I want to do everything that you've called me to do. And I want to be everything you've called me to be. Come on, is there anyone that got a little dust on their face? a little smell of sheep all over their body. But you know God has still anointed you. You know God has still blessed you. You know God still wants to use you. See, that's why your friends will be attracted to you because they're like, I know you. You're just little old David out in the field tending to the sheep. But the prophet of God has chosen you. (laughs) Well, if he's chosen you, I guess he can choose me too. See, this message today is for all those who need an encouragement. All those who feel like they've been hidden from the world. All those who feel like they've been forgotten about. All those who feel like they've been overlooked, undervalued. All those who have just been faithfully serving. All those who have just been faithfully given. 
See, what's so interesting is David didn't know it at the time, but that day when he was anointed king, when, when he was out in the field, as his father, Jesse, was calling him, David, come inside. Someone wants to see you. David didn't know it at the time, but that was the last time that David, David would ever walk without being anointed king. From that day forward, as a young boy, David was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Those were the last steps that he would ever take without being anointed king. And see, maybe this morning you didn't even know it. But you got out of bed, you hopped in your car, you drove to church today, and wherever you parked, whether in the dirt or in the parking lot, you stepped foot onto that asphalt and you began to make your way into the God's house this morning. And you, you didn't even know it, but heaven was standing at attention. God was looking down and saying, boys, he's up. She's up. <laughs> and God is ready to anoint those who are overlooked, undervalued, forgotten about, felt like they had no purpose, felt like they're a little dirty, felt like they don't have what it takes. <laughs> but I want to speak to you today like the prophet Samuel spoke to David. You're about to be the next king of Israel. Come on, God is about to use you in a mighty, mighty way. God is about to use you to change the, the trajectory of your whole entire family. God is about to use you to change the trajectory of, of this city. Come on, God is looking for a man and a woman after his own heart. Would you be like David, who's just faithfully serving, but hears the voice of the man of God and said, I'm ready to come inside. What do you have for me? Come on, is there any Davids in the house this morning? Come on, there's any anointed people. Come on, stand up to your feet this morning. Come on, God wants to anoint you. God wants to bless you. God wants to call you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. But we gotta have a heart like David who says, God, use me. If you need me in the field, I'll be in the field. If you need me in the palace, I'll be in the palace. God, I wanna be a man and a woman after your own heart. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me pray for you, God. I thank you for this word this morning. God, thank you for each and every person that is here under the sound of my voice. God, I pray right now that although they might not feel like they're worthy to be used by God, and God, maybe there's people that feel like the dust of their past is too much, and God, maybe there's people that feel like the, the dirt of what they've walked through is too much. God, I want to just break them free from that mindset right now that God still wants to bless them, that God still wants to use them, that God still sees them and calls them, that God has anointed them, chosen them for such a time as this. God, thank you for what you're gonna do in this series. God, thank you for the life of David, for these examples, for these stories, for these principles that we can use to take away and apply them to our life. And, and God, let us not just see David, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem, but let us see beyond David to another shepherd named Jesus. The perfect spotless lamb who gave his life for us, who traded places with us. He is the good shepherd who leads us, just like David said, beside still waters. Lord, let us see you in the life of David. So if you're here today and you don't know the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, you don't know what he's done for you, let me encourage you this morning that he loves you so much that he gave his life for you. That God the Father sent the Son, Jesus, here on the earth to be born in a little manger in Bethlehem to live a perfect, sinless life, to show us what it looked like to love God to serve, to sacrifice, to give. But he was also overlooked. He was also undervalued. So much so that we killed him. And he willingly gave up his life for you, for me, for the world. Traded places with us. He died the death that we deserve to die so we can live the life that he only deserves to live. And when Jesus was hung up on that cross, he, he had you in mind. 
He didn't fight back. He didn't wrestle to try to get down. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. The joy that was set before him was you. It was you, not your neighbor, not not your pastor. It It was you. He had you in mind. So he died on that cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But three days later, the good news is that he didn't stay there. He got up out of the grave. And the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave is now living on the inside of us. And the Bible says that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that God sent his son Jesus to die on our behalf, he was buried in the tomb and was raised to new life, then we will be saved. And so if that's you in here today and you're like, I've come to the end of myself, I've done life my own way for so long, I'm ready to make Jesus my Lord and my savior. I'm ready to be led by the good shepherd. If that's you in here today, I'm gonna pray for you. And I want you to repeat after me if you're like, that's me, pastor. I need to finally submit. I need to follow. I need to give my life, give my ways, give my mind, give my heart to Jesus. I wanna make him my Lord and my savior. I wanna pray for you and maybe we'll, we'll all pray this out loud for the sake of those saying this for the first time. But if that's you in here today, you just repeat after me. Say, dear God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that you died for me, that you were buried in a tomb, but three days later you rose again. I give you my life. I give you my heart. God, make me new. Forgive me of all my sins. I make you my Lord and my savior right now in this moment. Lead me, God. Use me, God. I want to be a man after your own heart. I want to be a woman after your own heart. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 and amen. Jesus.